This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. I am Russ. I'm Kyle. And we are joined, as usual, by Brad. How are you doing, Brad? Russ and Kyle, the, the brothers of the serpent. Good to see you guys. <laughs> yeah, I'm good, man. What you got behind you there? What is that? This is some uh, satellite image of Antarctica, but I can't tell you much more than that because I did it at the last minute here. But I've had it ah. in my huge bulk of satellite images, and I was like, uh, I got to have some ice. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. <laughs> nice and cool. <laughs> Mike. COVID Sir. free, still isolating. All right. COVID free. <laughs> that's good news. Randall? Yes, sir. How are you doing this week? Doing great. Doing great, man. Yeah, yeah. We're. Got to go ahead after nearly a one month delay. Got to go ahead on this 3,000 square foot project we're building, which is ah. going good today. The footings went in last week. The Masons are there today building up the foundation. So next week, our guys will go in and we'll, we'll start building the superstructure. You've had a, you've had a hell of a crew of <laughs> those uh, European craftsmen there for, man, that's, that's 20 years oh, now, probably. Our crew is top notch. Those guys yep. are. And, and yeah, and the guys that are Mitch Young are my good buddy. Who's a Mason, uh, over there building the, uh, the foundation top notch guy, just top notch. And our electrician Earl, Brad, you know, him Earl is top oh, yeah. notch. We got, we got some good people and that's the key to any successful enterprise is having the right mix of good people. So that's right. Yeah, it really is. And, and we got him here on this podcast. Thank yes, you we for do. <laughs> coming around, Snake Brothers, and uh, getting this going for us. This is like, can I, I don't know, can we say this? We don't say this anymore. It's episode 41. We're coming up on one year. 40, yeah, yeah. 40 41 episodes in our first year. I'm, uh, I'm pretty amazed we've been able to pull this off. Thank you. Guys. Yeah, it is amazing. What was and it's been a pleasure, man. We really appreciate uh, being able to be a part of it. So. Yep. Well, it has been fun. It's been it really fun. Has. No doubt. Of course, you know, it's added a whole element of stress to my life going, oh my God, it's Monday. I got to get ready for a podcast. What am I going to talk about? Well, I could tell old stories about working for Mike, but we'll save those. So yeah. what is on your agenda for tonight? Yeah, cameras on. Well, you we know, I, I've been thinking a lot about nano diamonds because um, they're one of the few proxies we haven't really talked about. And there's some interesting studies maybe three studies I'd like to reference um, on the nano diamonds, younger driest boundary nano diamonds. And then maybe get back to talking about Lake Hind if we have time, because I want to use Lake Hind to segue between the micro and the macro, because Russ has been really on my case about getting into the macro scale stuff. And I'm with him. I mean, because the macro scale stuff is certainly the stuff that you can actually, you know, get out in the field and see firsthand, Right. Um, but we've had a good example at this point of where the micro and the macro can kind of come together to complement each other. What am I referring to, Russ? Just to put you on the spot here. <laughs> Kyle knows. <laughs> proxies. <laughs> proxies. Well, yeah, proxies, but what is specific? We can a, spe a specific connection. Is it Lake St. Jean? What? Is it, yeah. is it Lake St. Jean? Yes. Is that what you're talking yes. about? Okay. Yeah. Perfect example of there you've got the lake, the depression, the catastrophic outflow, um, and then you have the, the, the microspherals at, right. at uh, Melrose that are of the Grenvellian province, That's which right. is centered right there on Lake Jean. So there is a, it doesn't prove that Lake Jean is an impact basin, but what it does do is certainly provide some pretty substantial evidence that that could be the case. because. Right, because the, 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 the impact would have produced the microspherals. The microspherals were de would have been deposited far and wide, but the one place where they've been discovered and studied uh, geochemically was in, in Pennsylvania. And, yeah, right. showed up. So there you have the proxy evidence completely supporting and supplementing 
the, 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 the macro evidence, the geomorphology of the, of the, of the field, you know, where you have the, you have the basin that happens to be occupied by a lake. And there are numerous verified impact basins and craters around the world that have lakes in them. So this is something very normal. This is not, you know, something, something odd. Yeah, go I ahead. I think the reason why nano diamonds have fascinated me the most out of all the proxies is because it's a lot harder to explain how those would be made in some other process. Right. Because I mean that the temperature and pressure required to make diamonds is really high. And I've seen, you know, there are some papers where they try to argue that these other, that some of these other, like the melt glass, for example, they say, well, these could be made in forest fires or something like that. Whereas nano diamonds, you're not going to make them in a, a forest fire or a house fire or a hearth fire or right. anything like that. Right, right. Well, the most comprehensive study, I would say up to this point, is um, a study by Kinsey. And others, Kinsey, Charles R. Kinsey, their paper came out in 2014, and it's entitled A Na Nano Diamond Rich Layer Across Three Continents Consistent with the Major Impact at 12,800 Cal BP. Cal BP is what? Calendar year or calibrated. Yeah. Years before present. Calibrated, Calibrated years, yes. But you, In other you, words, you, referring to the carbon dates, right? Uh, in this case, uh, we'll see what they're dating. No, I don't think it was carbon dating. Well, other than the fact that the, 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 the geological context of the nanodiamonds being at the base of the black mat layer. Okay, yeah. Right. Yeah. So they say that, uh, let's see here. Um, I'm trying to see here how many. Yeah, and it's uh, calibrated, not calendar, which is what I always want to think it is. Yeah, but that's okay because it, it, it essentially close. is your calendar. Okay, it, it is calendar years, so that's perfectly acceptable as long as you understand that it, the calibrated years is implying calendar years. Okay. So in their abstract, they go on to say that a major cosmic impact event has been proposed at the. Uh, onset of the uh, Younger Dryas cooling episode at approximately 12,800 plus or minus 150 years before present, forming the YD boundary layer, which we all know now is usually abbreviated as YDB, distributed over more than 50 million square kilometers on four continents. So that, of course, is not necessarily the limit of it. That's only the known extent. In other words, they go to these places, they go to Belgium, they go to Syria, they go to, to Venezuela, they discover that there's nanodiamonds. So each time there's a new site that has nanodiamonds or other impact proxies, it extends, as, extends the range of these effects, right? Is it limited to that? Probably not, and we'll, and we'll see why shortly. Um, so as it goes on to say, uh, in 24 dated stratigraphic sections in 10 countries of the Northern Hemisphere, the YDB layer contains a clearly defined abundance peak, an abundance peak in nano diamonds, a major cosmic impact proxy. Observed nano diamond polytypes include cubic, uh, uh, cubic diamonds, Lons delight like crystals, which we've talked about, and the difference is that the Lons delight, Lons delight him, tends to be hexagonal rather than cubical. Um, um, and diamond like carbon nanoparticles called N diamond and I diamond. That's the letter N dash diamond and I dash diamond. The nano diamond abundances in bulk. YDB sediments ranged up to approximately 500 parts per billion, and that in carbon spherules up to approximately 3,700 parts per billion. Um, and 138 samples contained no detectable nanodiamonds. Um, 
isotopic evidence indicates that the nanodiamonds were produced from terrestrial carbon, as with other impact diamonds, and were not derived from cosmic impact spherules. Now, one of the criti criticisms has been is that these particles, these these very these microscopic particles, are just part of the uh, regular ongoing catastrophic, not catastrophic, non-catastrophic rain of cosmic particles that happens to the Earth every day. One of the main criticisms from Pintar and, and Ishman was basically claiming that that's what uh, Kenneth and, and, and Firestone and the rest of these guys were just looking at. They're, you're just looking at the certainly non-catastrophic rain of particles that... Um, you know, has come down, uh, you know, every day without, without catastrophic consequences. Um, in fact, I have their, their, one of their, their quotes right here, which is, is really telling in a way. Um, when you get to 2008, yes. Now, this was published in Geological Society of America today, GSA today, um, in January of 2008. Uh, and this is what they say in there. And, and, and this was pretty much a couple of the guys that were the sort of the main instigators of the attacks on the impact hypothesis over the next couple of years, uh, particularly this guy Pinter, along with uh, Mark Boslow and a few others. They say just as close scrutiny of the Holocene impacts belies an extraterrestrial source, an impact on the southeastern Laurentide ice sheet at 12.9 thousand years ago proposed at the 2007 American Geophysical Union Joint Assembly engenders similar doubts. So in other words, they're saying that the there's been proposed by, by Bruce Massey and, and a number of others that there have been more Holocene impacts than have been uh, recognized, right? And that's something we're going to be talking about is some of the studies that suggest that there have been a lot of overlooked impact events within the Holocene. Now, you guys, um, I'm sure, know what the Holocene is, right? Because you are now the Holocene, the Holocene, what are you calling it? LLC. The Holocene yes. LLC. See, so you damn sure better know what the Holocene is, or I'm going to give you a really hard time about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> well, that's the current period that we're in. Yeah. Yes. Right. It began and, after at the end of the Younger Dryas, the Holocene begins. Yes. And, and which is yes. this, and, which is this basic period of calm since all of that craziness. Since that crazy, in a way. Although it hasn't yeah. been that calm. It's you know, right. The calm is relative because relative yes, calm. relative to the to the craziness and all the graphs you've been showing us. Yeah, for the, 42 the craziness of the Younger episodes. Dryas is unique within the geogra geological record of, of a couple of million years. You know, yeah. it stands yeah, the, out like a sore thumb. But the Holocene itself, has it been that, it, it's been punctuated. It definitely yeah. has. Yeah, but the Pleistocene was definitely more ups and downs, a lot more ups and downs than the Holocene has had. Right. Well, the Pleistocene, bear in mind now, the Pleistocene is generally estimated now to be about two and a half million years. Yeah. Right. So a lot has happened within that two and a half million years. Um, you know, the ice core records that we've been looking at from Greenland, I think they run back to about 240 to 250,000 years. So we're still looking at, you know, 10 times more length than, than that for the entire Holocene. What did I say? Two and a half yeah, about two and a half million years. Right. Um, so, so within that two and a half million years, a lot of shit has happened. Yes. Um, right. And and there have been episodes I think that have probably come close. But I, I've brought this up a number of times: is that if we're actually using the loss of species as our measuring as our yardstick, we have to go back millions of years, maybe even as far back as five million years, to find a period where there was. Uh, equivalent uh, mortality of, uh, of the dominant species as occurred at the Younger Dryas. It was the hemp hillian uh, event. And I'm not sure, I haven't studied that enough to know if there's any evidence of, of ET, but I think there is. I think I have seen a couple of things um, that maybe right around that time there may have been actually a flurry of impacts. There may have been an impact, at least one impact, into the Pacific Ocean 
that appears to perhaps date with the onset of the Pleistocene. That's something would be worth and interesting to explore uh, later on. But my point is that what happened during the Younger Dryas really does stand out in its own way. And, and one of the unique things about it is the signatures that were the, the cosmic signatures that we're, we're finding there. And, you know, are these going to be found in other places? I don't know. But one of the studies I'm, we're going to look at in a second, uh, taken in the panhandle of Oklahoma, is interesting uh, because it is. They, did, they were looking for nanodiamonds at the Younger Dryas, and, and they found them, but they found them somewhere else, too. So anyway, so, so, so the critics go on here. They say, um, so they, they say, just as close scrutiny of the Holocene impacts belies an extraterrestrial source. So they say that they have now looked at the evidence themselves. They've decided that there was no evidence that there was any Holocene impacts. So they're saying, so we've, we've, we've dismissed that. They're, now they're saying that an impact in the southeastern Laurentide ice sheet at 12.9 KA, proposed at the 2007 American Geophysical Union Joint Assembly, engenders similar doubts. The purported impact is cited as a trigger for the Younger Dryas climate event, extinction of Pleistocene megafauna, demise of the Clovis culture, the dawn of agriculture, and other events. Let me pause. No, nobody's saying that the impact caused the dawn of agriculture. Yes, extinction of Pleistocene megafauna, yes. Demise of the Clovis culture, yes. Dawn of agriculture, no. They're not saying oh, that, that agriculture was caused by the impact in a direct way. It, it, the impact could have been directly responsible for the demise of the Clovis culture and the extinction of the megafauna. Agriculture came about three, two, three, four thousand years later because of the radically altered post-glacial climate was the main factor in, in so th their comment is misleading. Um, and it, it just suggests to me that, that they're looking at this really not, you're kind of looking at it superficially in a sense. Oh, no, 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 nobody said that caused the dawn of agriculture. Now, to the extent that the impact would have been uh, a factor in the climate change, yes, then indirectly it would have maybe led to the rise of agriculture. But that's still part of what's being worked out. You know, it's not clear how an impact would have in, how, how an impact would have caused the transition from the, the depths of a glacial age into the interglacial Holocene that we're in now. That's not clear. So 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 that comment of theirs, by throwing that in there, it's kind of a red herring, see, because they're not saying that. They're not saying that it was responsible for the dawn of agriculture. They might be saying that it was played a role in causing climate change. The climate change would have led to the dawn of agriculture two or three thousand years later. But so that's misleading. So ev they go on to say evidence of the 12.9 impact includes magnetic grains, microspherals, iridium, glass like carbon, carbonaceous, carbonaceous deposits draped over mammoth bones, fullerenes enriched in helium 3 and micron-scale nanodiamonds. We suggest the data are not consistent with the four to five kilometer diameter impactor that has been proposed, but rather with the constant and certainly non-catastrophic rain of sand-sized micrometeorites into Earth's atmosphere. Now, this is a straw man because nobody is saying oh, it's all settled and we all agree now in this consensus that we've got a four to five kilometer diameter impactor. Amongst the attempts to explain the extinctions, the demise of the Clovis culture, the rapid climate change, and now the abundance of proxy evidence that's showing up at a critical boundary. Okay, so here you've got this phenomenon. You're going, what in the world happened here? How are these things connected? So what you begin doing, how science works, is you begin putting forward hypotheses to test. One of the, one of the analysis would have suggested that the amount of microspherals found, and I forget exactly where, would have been consistent. No, maybe, it was the, uh, maybe it was the platinum spike. I'll have to go back. But one of the cases could have been uh, something like a four to five diameter kilometer impactor. 
However, that's just one model, one object, right? What we're looking at now looks considerably more complicated than that. I mean, I think clearly at this point, we're looking at a multi-impact event. And so coming back to that, the point to take away from this is that they're saying that it is, like they say, the constant and certainly non-catastrophic rain of sand-sized micrometeorites into the Earth's atmosphere. Now, if you'll notice, uh, the Firestone paper came out in uh, October of 2007. Okay, this paper came out in January of 2008. So in that interim time, and given that it, it's, it's published in 2008, it had to have been submitted right after the publication of the Firestone paper. The Firestone paper, remember, that's the key paper. Evidence for an extraterrestrial impact 12,900 years ago that contributed to the megafaunal extinctions and the Younger Dryas cooling. That was the paper that sort of really launched the controversy, right? This paper that I just quoted from January of 2008. So obviously, and when you look at the scientific literature, it had to have been submitted at least a month, maybe two months earlier. So in the interim time, which would have literally been probably just a few weeks between the publication of the Firestone paper and the submission of this response, to it. Oh, and by the way, the, the title of the paper really kind of, uh, to me, uh, underscores where their mindset is. Impacts, mega tsunami, and other extraordinary claims. <laughs> right? So how much verification were they able to do? Okay, so here comes this whole team of what, 17 scientists who've been looking at, at like seven or eight different sites and discovering these proxies, some of them are the best in their field, right? Coming out saying, here's, we found these proxies at this site, at, at these various sites. And they, and, and they list those proxies right here. Uh, you know, uh, iridium, microspherals, magnetic grains, glass-like carbon, carbonaceous deposits draped over mammoth bones, fullerenes enriched in helium-3 and micron-scale nanodiamonds. We suggest that the data are not consistent with a four to five kilometer diameter impactor that has, which, that has been proposed, which let's clarify, was one of the ideas proposed in attempting to explain whether there's a commonality to all of this. The fact that you had these events, that you had this extraordinary series of climate changes, that you had the mass extinctions of, of megafauna, you had the collapse of the Clovis culture, you had these they don't get into this here, but the, the, the massive meltwater floods, which to me is part of that whole equation. So now you hear of the response, right, by the skeptics. So my point is, is what level of verification of any of this were they able to, to perform in the several weeks between the publication of the Firestone paper in 2007 and their submission of this response to it? Probably none. So what is that telling you? It's just telling you that They've already made up their minds. They've already got it in their heads that this is constant and certainly non-catastrophic rain, right? So we've, we've now dismissed it out of hand. We don't need to go there. That's basically what this is about. However, however, they do kind of are right about something. So let's see what they say. They say that the 12.9 KA impact story has struggled to bring its disparate evidence under a single umbrella. Well, yeah, yeah, when you find, yeah, uh, should they not? Should there be no struggle? No. Obviously, nobody's going to go, oh, mass extinction, cultural collapse, massive climate change, massive melting, rapid rise in sea level, now signatures of all of this. Oh, well, boom, let's explain it. We, oh, let's just see what we've got in our pocket here. Let's pull out and say, okay, here's the explanation. No, not at all. But how are they presenting it here, the critics? Well, it struggled to bring its disparate evidence under a single umbrella. The impact story originated in Firestone and Topping in 2001, which it did. And they were actually not proposing an impact. I think they were proposing a... Uh, 
what was it, a nearby supernova? I read the paper so long ago, I've forgotten now. But the Firestone et al. 2006 book, both of which contain observations and claims so wild that other work by these authors invites careful scrutiny. The nature of the 12.9 thousand year event changes radically with each iteration from a supernova generated cosmic ray jet to a massive atmospheric airburst to multiple ET airbursts along with surface impacts. So, ah, so they're, they're not allowed to refine their idea. No, you have to just, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Oh, okay. Yeah. Here's all of this evidence that we have to explain. Well, yeah. So what they're saying here is that, 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 that they're attacking because the normal course of science is that you yeah. run through multiple iterations and, and test right. multiple hypotheses before you come yeah. to any conclusions. Yeah. So, so these guys are actually being attacked for doing good science. See, so see, th 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 there's groups that want to be the self-appointed defenders of the status quo. I, yeah. Brad, that's ex I think that's exactly and it. And they come out immediately, and it's just it's strange that they want to fight against it without immediately giving it a chance. Yeah, that's my point. Not like, hmm, this is this is interesting. Let's test this ourselves. Let's go look ourselves and see. No, not that. Literally knee jerk immediately, boom, submit this thing to him. Well, it's yeah. certainly the non catastrophic constant non catastrophic rain of micrometeorites that is explaining all of this. Of course, yep. I don't think that constant and, and, and non catastrophic rain of micrometeorites is going to be responsible for you know killing off the woolly mammoths, but. <laughs> <laughs> See, and here's the and thing. It, and it, it shouldn't be responsible for peak abundances in the layer. There was the, you, you, you uh, I think it was a paper that you showed us a while back where they were trying to claim that somehow these micro spherules or nano diamonds and stuff are all sort of sifting their way down through the dirt and making this peak layer. Yeah, they're ending mm -hmm. up in that one layer and making it look like there's a peak. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Why that one layer over and over and over again? It's got <laughs> magnets in it. <laughs> okay, but now let's get to okay. So okay, we 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 can uh, you know condemn their their initial knee jerk attitude, but I think it's important to look at the critics, look at both sides of an issue, and say okay, look, maybe there's some maybe they do have some valid points, and they do say here that air bursts are a convenient explanation. Well, yeah, they are certainly convenient because. We know, look, we just got through talking about Tunguska, right? There's an airburst. We've got a an example, an empirical example in our history, right? In our recent history. We talked about the 1913 event, which, you know, could have been a multiple Tunguska type event. We looked at Shoemaker Levy Levy 9, which was like a multiple. We saw, we saw, witnessed ourselves a comet nucleus being torn apart formed 21 subnuclei and watched those 21 subnuclei fall into Jupiter, right? Well, we know now from crater chains that multiple impact events are more common than anybody thought, right? Because comets break up. They create, they undergo a hierarchical fragmentation life cycle, right? And that, that, that hierarchical life cycle creates in that rather high hierarchical fragmentation creates the possibility for episodes uh, uh, we, we call what what uh, Victor Klub and William Napier and 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 uh, Asher and and steel Duncan Steele and a bunch of others have said uh, referred to as an uh, an impact epoch right which is something we're going to really look at in 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 much greater detail um, but they say in, by way of dismissal, the critics here, they're saying airbursts are a convenient explanation given the lack of an impact crater. Number one, number one, this is important because this is constantly being brought up and thrown in the face of the, of the impact proponents, the lack or, or, or a presumed lack of an impact crater. Of course, now this is pre-crater Hiawatha, right? Problem with Crater Hiawatha at this point is we just don't know the date. It might be much older than Younger Dryas, which of course would discount it as a candidate impact, but we don't know, 
Um, unless something has been learned in the last month or two, I haven't kept up with every latest. But the last I've looked and what I've read, the dating could be could be as young as younger Dryas, but it also could be considerably older. So we're going to have to just kind of let that one sit there for a while until we know more. And I would say in the, in the interest of being conservative, let's not bring that forward and, and declare that that is, you know, unequivocally an impact crater uh, produced during the younger, at the younger driest boundary. So they say that air bursts are a convenient explanation given the lack of an impact crater, tectites, shocked quartz, or high pressure minerals. Tectites, worthy of a show in itself, or at least part of a show where we get into, think of tectites as the splash. So you've got an impact into the, into the terrain. You have this fusion of, of terrestrial target material and cosmic impactor that is just thrown, then thrown up into the atmosphere, liquefied, right? It rains back down, and as it rains down, and this is the conventional explanation, which I think has got to be fairly close, rains back down and forms a series of aerodynamic shapes, tectites. Um, We've looked at some pictures of those. I mean, Kyle, you could always pull up tectites and get some some photos on the ready so that people can see what some examples of tectites. But they list four things: an impact crater, the lack of an impact crater, tectites, shock quartz, or high pressure minerals. Now, shock quartz is when you have a silica-based, typically a quartz-based target rock, and the shock wave passes through the uh through the substrate, and it and it causes multiple lamellae or fractures within the quartz bedrock. So there'd be two things you could pull up. You could find tectites and shocked quartz. So people can see an example of shock quartz compared to regular quartz. But shock quartz now has been found in association with a lot of known impact craters. It has now become one of the di- diagnostic criteria for actually uh, identifying impact craters yeah and so hey we found we found pictures of tectites let's let's have sh- a look shock quartz well let's i would say i was going to say let's take a break and then we'll come back and we can look at those because that sounds really exciting and then we got to get All back right. to nano diamond All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Glad to be back. Cosmographia, Monday night. It's always a great time for us. It is. And uh, before we get back into the uh, the main topic here, we wanted to take a minute to talk about the CBD oil that uh, Randall's been trying out. Okay, well, you know, I was. this is my first time I've ever been asked to endorse a product, and I said, well, I'm not going to endorse a product unless I like the product, and I actually use it and find it a benefit or of value to me. I've been testing it three weeks now, and this is what I have to report. For the last year, a couple of years, I used, I like to work out, and I haven't been able to work out because of inflammation in my lower back. The last week and a half, I've been working out. I don't know what to attribute it to other than I think I'm, I've been religiously doing this CBD oil. And on top of that, the other thing that I have to report is that my sleep seems to be a lot deeper and and more solid. Uh, I'm not waking up as much, uh, laying there awake. And I don't know what else to attribute it to other than in, in talking to Mike Robertson, who introduced me to this particular brand. He said that these were the things that I could expect. And so at this point, I'm a, a believer. I mean, I'm a believer in CBD oil. It just, I haven't obviously tried all of the products that are out there, but this product certainly seems to fit the bill. And so I would feel very comfortable at this point endorsing the product and suggesting that other people try it. And, and it's and CBD of the gods. It is uh, from CB, the gods. CBD, CBD from, from the, gods, the gods. And their, their website is um, cbdfromthegods.com. So right. you can learn a lot about it. And I, and the other thing I'll say though, is my wife, you know, was an electrician for many years working with screwdrivers and wrenches and stuff. Her hands and wrists took a beating. And, and, and I got to get this out. I got to say this. So 
she started getting arthritis in her hands about four or five years ago. And it slowly was getting worse to where her knuckles were swelling up and she was having a hard time gripping things. She's gone to the doctor and she's had, I think, two or three their infusions. It helps her hands. They last for six months. They cost $3,000 each. He's been doing the CBD salve. This stuff right here. This stuff. That's the stuff she's been doing on her hands. For the first time in about two or three years, she comes to me. She, generally, if you got a, a, a jar with a tight lid, she'll come to me and say, can you open, open this it. for me? Yeah, yeah, I can't because it requires this. I come into the kitchen a few days ago, and she's in there opening up a can of something. <laughs> nice. I, I would open awesome. that for you. What? She says, oh, well, I didn't even think of it. I says, wow. You're, nice. how, are you, how are you? What's going on here? I mean, you, you haven't been able to do that for three or four years. I said, do you think that it's the salve? And she goes, I think it is. I think it's the salve. I mean, I've been rubbing it on my hands and wrists every day. So now we've worked out a thing where she puts it on her hands and then she rubs it on my back with her hands and wrists like this. Ah. So we're killing two birds with one stone. And you know there what? You For me to be able to work out and not have my back start spazzing on me because of inflammation, that is a huge step for me. So, you know, I, I started, you know, I've got two old back injuries that have flared up over the years and, and um, have really slowed me down. Now, if I can get that, and, and, and now I'm convinced that the CBD is helping. I had done some experimentation with CBD oil earlier, six months to a year ago, I probably didn't do it religiously enough to get the benefits. So, but then it was the issue of, well, okay, God, there's all these new products out there. Which one do I go with? And then Mike Robertson comes and says, well, try this one, this one. And he convinced me that what they were doing was that they were really good people, that it was independently lab tested for hundred percent purity. So yeah, let me, let me try it. I'll give it a try. And if it seems to work and I like it, yeah, I'll endorse it. So officially I'm endorsing it. All right. At this and, point. And again, that's CBD from the gods. Yeah. And it's CBD from the gods.com to, to check out their products. And uh, yeah. So just, just for full transparency though, you, you've mentioned that you are like mega dosing vitamin D, but is that, is that like the only other thing that you're doing simultaneously? Well, here? The, since the COVID uh, I've been taking 10,000 IUs of international units of vitamin D and like, two to three grams of vitamin C every day. Um, uh -huh. But the thing is, see, I've done that before. That's the point. This isn't the first time I've mega dosed with D or C or, or selenium or, or zinc. Yep. yep. What's Just different to be this clear though, that, that this is something that you're taking and there's not some other group of substances that are part of your system that's influencing it. It's well, really now, CBD. see, here's the thing. And, and what I've learned is that the, that the endocannabinoid system interacts with everything else you're doing. Yeah. And so when you're doing the CBD oil, it might actually be enhancing and working with other things that you're with what you're doing. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Great. Hmm. Awesome. I got to try uh, it. I'm going to, yeah, got to get Russ <laughs> some first, but uh, yeah, yeah, put me in line too. We'll be, well, yeah. I mean, that. looking at the bottle here. Yeah. Uh, it, let's see. I'm seeing, yeah. Hair growth, hair regrowth, <laughs> um, you know, but you, well, hey, you I'm, massage I'm with, it. I'm with Julie. I'm with Julie there. I've, you know, squeezed a bunch of pliers and cut a bunch of wire. So, you know, I got, yeah. I got uh, rough hands too. So uh, yeah. I as long as she did, but uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to try some of that salve also. Yeah. Uh, good. Cut the, All right. Cut the wires, squeeze the pliers. <laughs> I think. Yeah, man. A whole lot of that. Put on the salve and feel better. That's right. All right. We got a few pictures to show here. Yeah. Let's um, see what you got on the uh, shocked course there, guys. Yeah, we got tectites, shock quartz. Oh, all right. So this first one, this is a this is a tectite. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Very oh, yes. Tectite. Like hexagonal weird. I know. This is a set of tectites. Not copper lights, yeah. tectites. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they are. They kind of look like copper lights. Somewhat aerodynamic shapes. <laughs> we need a scale on that. I wonder what size those are. Two inch, half two inch. inch, maybe. Yeah, yeah probably yeah. one yeah. to two inches. I mean, I've seen tectites that are four and five inches long. Uh -huh. Yeah, but yeah, look at there. You've and got there were typical... there were some there were some dumbbell shaped ones and stuff. This one's got a slight, you know, dumbbell mm -hmm. shape. It to does. It, but, uh, Copper light. 
in your teardrop shape down here to the right. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, this is a shock quartz. Yeah. Very interesting looking. And obviously, I mean, you can tell the difference between that and normal quartz. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, And that's not on the surface. That's something that's been sliced. Yeah. They they cut it. Yeah. So that's, yeah, within an interior graining. Yeah. Yeah. When we were looking this up, there was a lot, most of the shock quartz photos were actually sliced. Mm -hmm. There were images of slices. So you could see this pattern. Yeah. Okay, and that's and this look, is look a at the size cone. scale on that though, 0. 0.2 millimeters. So was it two two hundred mic- microns there? I mean, yeah, that's a really Pretty, fine yeah. structure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that, the last one is the shatter cone there. Yeah, yeah. The difference is now shatter cones are in carbonaceous based rocks like limestone and dolomite, yeah. and mm-hmm. shot quartz are in the silica based quartz based rocks. Right. Gotcha. But yeah, Bradley right. and I visited. What year did we go in and tour the Kentland in, in, uh, impact structure? Uh, it was 04. Yeah, up 04, in Indiana, yeah. northern Indiana, close to, yeah, getting up toward uh, Chicago there, Kentland. Yeah, that's limestone terrain. And you have beautiful examples of of, uh, of shatter cones in in um, the Kentland in the impact structure that we went to. Um, yeah, our goal is to go to every impact structure on Earth. I just have to yeah. say I'm I'm amazed at how Brad like instantly knows the date, the year, <laughs> the names of everything that was around it, and all the people that were there. And well, it's, just, it's, it's Randall's like, where where were we, Brad? And he's like, oh yeah, archive, it was... you know, <laughs> well, I mean, you've you've seen my extensive file names. Well, that's yes, why I know. I get folders that's what, and pictures, and I've named all that stuff, so it's it's in my head because I've, that's I've what Kyle sorted said, it and yeah, labeled yeah. it all over the years. <laughs> yeah, Brad. Brad sends me files on the FTP server, and I'm like, "Oh, God. <laughs> huge names, <Yeah. laughs> 72 characters long." <laughs> well, folder, you see, folder, see how well folder, folder, worked folder, together. Folder. You see, yeah, yeah. He saves yep, me. He 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 gives me some. He you know saves me some brain power that I can apply to other things. Right. And I can yeah. always refer to him. Oh, well, Brad will know. Let's see. So where were we that day? Yeah. <laughs> where were we at 335 on June 5th, 2003? Oh, well, we I were. I was driving. Yeah. <laughs> I was driving. That would, be, that would be the common answer. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Supplemental yeah, really memory cool. here. Yeah. Teamwork. Yeah. It is great teamwork. I love it. You know, we're, we're segueing away from uh, micro into the macro. And so, yeah, let, it, let us keep going here. So I, I'm, I'm quoting from this article. That came out in uh, uh, in uh, Geological Society of America today, in January of 2008, a couple of months after the release of the Firestone paper, entitled "Impacts, Mega Tsunami, and Other Extraordinary Claims." Mega tsunami is definitely something we want to come back to. I don't know why that's so extraordinary. The idea that you would have an impact into an ocean obviously is going to create a mega tsunami. So what the hell? I mean, what's what? You know, look. Do you think that the, that that they only land that they only hit on land? Well, okay. So what they're saying here then um, is that uh, evidence of the twelve point nine impact includes, and they list the ver- the things that the various re- researchers have found at this boundary: magnetic grains, microspherals, iridium, glass like carbon carbonaceous deposits draped over mammoth bones, fullerenes enriched in helium-3, and micron-scale nanodiamonds. We suggest that the data are not consistent with the 4 to 5 kilometer diameter impactor that has been proposed. Well, see, that's one model that's been proposed. You've got 100 different people that have looked at this from different angles and have proposed different explanations, right? So what you do is you pick out the weakest one to attack. That's what they're doing here. And it's all of this, all of this evidence is certainly just the constant and, and, and non-catastrophic rain of sand sized micrometeorites into the earth's atmosphere. Okay. So then they talk about, uh, you know, um, that air bursts are a convenient explanation given the lack of an impact crater tights, shocked quartz or high pressure minerals. Okay. Now shock quartz, Tectites and high pressure minerals are all a consequence of a direct impact into a terrestrial target, right? Into a into the lithosphere, into a terrain 
of the Earth's crust, right? So if you have an impact into an ocean, well, you probably, you know, unless the the impactor itself is much greater than the depth of the ocean, you're not going to have a typical impact crater, right? You're not going to have tectites because the splash is now water coming back down. You're not going to have shocked quartz, and you're not going to have high-pressure minerals. So none of those things would apply to an oceanic impact, unless, of course, there was a crater excavated on the ocean floor, which has to do with the ratio of dia uh, uh, impact or diameter and vo entry velocity and the depth of the ocean. However, what happens is now the studies that we're, and we're going to look at those studies, the, the limited studies that do exist of impacts into ocean. And of course, the, the transient crater is, is this outrush of water away from the impact site, which then, of course, rushes back in, right? The, 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 the walls of the, of the ocean, which temporarily form this crater in the ocean water, collapse back in. They rush back in to the point of impact, and when they do, they're carrying huge amounts of sediment with them. This is called the resurge wave by those who have looked at it. The resurge wave as typically carries in huge amounts of sediment and also obliterates the crater rim. If, if the impact actually excavated a crater basin on the ocean floor, it had a raised rim. Now you've got the resurge wave coming back in, carrying huge volumes of sediment with it and, and obscuring the rim filling up the crater and so therefore making it very difficult to identify if if and that's even if it, it, it the, the the impact event is of such magnitude that it can excavate uh, a, a basin on the crater floor if you have a half kilometer object impacting into the ocean where the ocean is you know two or three times that deep well no now you don't have an impact uh, because the ocean water absorbs all the energy of the impact and then, of course, that energy then has to get translated into tsunami waves. So I don't know why in their minds, and, and when those tsunami waves make landfall, they're going to have to leave some kind of geomorphic evidence of their passage, right? So I don't know why they're immediately claiming that a mega tsunami is something so extraordinary that we can just dismiss it with a wave of the hand. But here they go on to say, the 12.9 kilometer impact story also has struggled with the broad range of impact-related materials reported. Now, here's where it gets interesting, and here is where they're out bringing up some legitimate questions. Firestone and Topping identified chondrules, suggesting that the impactor was a chondrite, a chondritic meteorite. Magnetic grains and spherules are consistent with an iron-rich meteoroid, whereas silicate material suggests a stony meteoroid, and glass-like carbon and carbon spherules suggest a carbonaceous source. Firestone and others suggest geochemical affinities with lunar crustal material. Any one of these might be a credible extraterrestrial source, but together they are a Frankenstein monster, incompatible with any single impactor or known impact event. To which I would say, they're right. They're right. It is a Frankenstein monster. Question, question is, what they're assuming is because it's a Frankenstein monster, that monsters aren't real. But we've had 12 years of additional studies and research by independent teams that have confirmed over and over again that this cosmic Frankenstein monster is very real. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Is that why they're going with the fragment fragmenting comet now? Because a fragmenting comet can be a Frankenstein monster. It can have all that stuff embedded yes. in the icy matrix. Okay. This would be the assumption. And you know, we're we're what we're learning now about cometary nuclei is yes, they can they they seem to be able uh, to display evidence of being very heterogeneous objects. Right. They can have iron stuff in there and the carbonaceous stuff in there and the silicates in there uh -huh. all mixed in. Okay. Yeah. But important, important point that's brought up over and over again, lack of an impact crater, lack of an impact crater. And of course the lack of an impact crater then 
implies lack of tectites, lack of shock quartz, lack of, of high pressure mineral that would be formed in that area. What were they saying about lunar material? What was that part? Well, uh, in one of Firestone's early papers, he's talking about similarities, geochemical similarities with some of the uh, composition of some of the lunar rocks, okay. which is interesting. Which is all- because that brings us to another dimension of this whole thing, which is that this episode, bombardment episode, may not have been limited to the Earth. To the Earth, right. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing I was going to say is, well, the, the moon has been being hit by this stuff too. So it would make sense that some lunar rocks would have similar compositions. Yes. Okay. So they conclude by saying that both the 12.9 thousand year ago impact and the Holocene mega, mega tsunami appear to be spectacular explanations on long fishing expeditions for shreds of support. Both stories have played out primarily in the popular press, highlighting how successful impact events can be in attracting attention. The desire for such attention is understandable in an environment where science and scientific funding are increasingly competitive. The National Science Foundation now emphasizes transformative research, and few events are as transformative as an impact. In an era when evolution, geologic deep time, and global warming are under assault, this type of science by press release and spectacular stories to explain unspectacular evidence consume the finite commodity of scientific credibility. Where's my monocle? I was going to say, you know know what's coming. (laughs) (laughs) Snorts of derision. Yeah, right. well, my so <laughs> my thought is I'd like to take these, this unspectacular evidence, I'd like to take these guys and spend a week in the channel Scablands in with the them. Scablands, yeah. No, nothing spectacular here. Nothing oh. spectacular about a 900-foot, you know, two-mile-wide waterfall. You know, nothing, nothing spectacular about that. And then, of course, yeah, go ahead, retreat into your proglacial lake ice dam theory. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, please do that. Because let's, I think we need to talk about that. Because if it ain't that, it's something else. And I don't think that's it. See? Anyhow, nano diamonds. So th- the best study of uh, nano diamonds, I think, was the one by Kinsey. Uh, let's see, was that 2014? I think Kinsey was 2014. The nano diamond rich layer across three continents, consistent with major cosmic impact of 12,800 uh, years. Let's see what they have to say here. We have presented a detailed protocol for isolating younger driest boundary nano diamonds, requiring the use of numerous regions, reagents. The identification of the isolated nano diamonds involves two main methods electron microscopy imaging, and electron spectroscopy. Using up to nine imaging, analytical, and quantification procedures, you have scanning electron microscopy, um, transmission electron microscopy, high-resolution transmission electron microscopy, energy dispersive spectroscopy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, fast Fourier transform, uh, uh, electron energy loss spectroscopy, and others. We won't get into those now. They're all really interesting technologies that are making it possible to really get in and identify these th- this microscale evidence that we couldn't have, I- couldn't have isolated and identified 50 years ago. The entire procedure is, is labor-intensive intensive and technically demanding. Even so, it has proven to be effective and replicable by skilled independent groups based on the processing of more than 100 samples. The presence of nanodiamonds at 24 sites in 10 countries on three continents, including results from six independent groups, is strong evidence for the existence of younger, driest, boundary, abundance peaks in nanodiamonds. Some re- researchers have proposed that YDB nanodiamonds result originated from wildfires, volcanism, the mantle, 
and or by unknown processes that are coincidentally coeval. But those hypotheses can be rejected because each fails to account for the entire assemblage of proxies. Numerous accepted impact events display the same evidence as found at the Younger Dryas boundary. And the Younger Dryas boundary and the Cretaceous tertiary impact layers contain the only known multi-continental coeval abundance peaks in the entire assemblage of proxies within the past 65 million years. Of all the proposed hypotheses, a cosmic impact event at the onset of the Younger Dryas cooling episode is the only hypothesis capable of explaining the simultaneous deposition of peak abundances in nanodiamonds, magnetic and glassy spherules, melt glass, platinum, and other proxies across at least four continents covering 50 million square kilometers. The evidence strongly supports a major cosmic impact event at 12,800 plus or minus 150 Cal BP. And so this was the most extensive of the uh, of the studies done. There were, there were other studies done uh, on the um, the presence of nanodiamonds. Uh, I would like to say this: didn't she just, or I don't know if it's a she uh, in the paper? They just basically put that question about the uh, monster that was in the refutation kind of to rest. If the, if those same proxies are all found together at the Chicxulub crater or the boundary associated with it, right? Yeah. Then, then this happens. These Frankenstein monsters exist, and there's already one that's accepted. Pretty much, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, just before the publication of... Um, the Kinsey paper, which, by the way, was, uh, let's see, Kinsey was, uh, how many? A lot. A lot of, lot of authors here. Um, and, and that was 2014, 2014. I was going to ask that. Kinsey yeah, at, at Al 2014. Okay. Yes. I believe it was published. Let's see. It was published by Proceedings of the uh, National Academy of Sciences. Uh, Okay, we'll get that link in the uh, description, uh, the show notes for everybody. Yeah, uh, now here, digging into. here is a nano diamond aggregate. I'm going to do a share screen nano diamond aggregate of uh, impact, the Papagai impact in Siberia. Now, this is a glassy like material, but within this material are found huge numbers of nano diamonds. And it looks very similar to the, to the green. Uh, desert glass that we were that we were looking at right the, are you talking about moldavite or the trinitite well the trinitite trinitite okay yeah. the trinitite yeah and here you've got um you've got the uh you can see the, the, those little black spots those are all nano diamonds within this matrix of this of this i uh, i believe this is one of the carbon spherules here and this is uh, looking at a sample of it, and you can see all of the little nano diamonds embedded in there. Um, Super tiny. Yeah. Here's the abundances of nano diamonds. Yeah, abundance of nano diamonds for 22 younger driest boundary stratigraphed by depth, centimeters below surface. Most of the six independent studies did not quantify nano diamonds at or near the younger driest boundary are not represented here. Um, so basically what we can see here um, is in all of these independent studies from Syria, you go through and here the, the, the Y axis is the depth scale. The, the X axis is the, is the abundance scale and the gray bar represents the younger driest. So here you have, Abu Herrera, Syria. You see that there's a major nano diamond spike right there from pretty much nothing up to about 400 parts per billion. You go to Arlington Canyon, California, that we've talked about. Um, up here is the, um, is the type of technology used to identify 
these. And of course, you can go into the paper and get all the background, the technical background on the procedures used. But yeah, same thing here at Arlington Canyon. Here's South Carolina, Bull Creek, Oklahoma. Um, huge spike right there. Showbot in uh, Alberta, Canada. You've got Daisy Cave, California, Ganey in Michigan, uh, Kangerlussuaq, I don't know how, how to pronounce that, in Greenland. And this is a study we're going to talk about in a minute here. Um, Kimball Bay, North Carolina, Lake Cuzio, Mexico, we've talked about that. So nano diamonds are being found at all of these places. Lake Hind in Manitoba, uh, at a depth of 30 centimeters, you have the younger driest boundary, and you have a peak in nano diamonds there. Now, bear in mind that at the time we get to this, we're looking at six independent teams that have gone out and found these things at these various sites. Um, we have uh, Germany, we have Belgium. Let's see, my I can't. There we. Let me get this out of the way. Um, uh, Lindenmeyer, Colorado, Lingen, Germany. We have Belgium. We have, there's our Melrose, Pennsylvania. We've been talking about the microspherals found there. And there's a nano diamond spike, Murray Springs, Arizona, Newtonville, New Jersey, the Netherlands, Spain, Ohio, Topper, South Carolina, Watcomb Bottom in the UK. So you've got multiple sites now where nano diamond enrichment is being found at the Younger Dryas. Here we have the three techniques for identifying candidate nanodiamonds. Uh, a and B are from scanning transmission electron microscopy images of clusters of nanodiamonds from Murray Springs, Arizona. Um, a and B, let's see. Uh, C is a bright field, high resolution transmission electron microscopy of nanodiamond rich residue from Murray Springs. Uh, D is a high-resolution transmission electron microscopy image of a rounded cubic nanodiamond from Lake Cuzio. Parallel lines represent the 111 type lattice planes at 2.06 angstrom spacing, which is consistent with, with diamond. Uh, yeah, so here's a, a larger version of that. And then more, more of the technologies used to identify um, you know, here you have the fast Fourier transform technique. We're not going to get into that right now. Um, but yeah, it, it has to do, the spacing here is is unique to every different element. So that's how you identify whether these things are composed primarily of carbon, which would be the case if, if they were, in fact, nano diamonds. Um, so here's actually transmission electron microscopy images in reverse contract, contrast for clarity. Um, selected area diffraction patterns, that's your SAD, your SAD, right? But you can see here, you see the little diamonds. Um, Santa Mara, uh, which is C, which is uh, carbon, the CS is carbon spherules. So these diamonds are found inside carbon spherules. Um, Lindenmeyer, E, and this is the... Um, the, the uh, fast Fourier transform. The target for the ring there is 110. Is that the idea for the carbon? Is that what I was seeing? So it's well, 111 is, is basically hitting it, isn't that? Yes, isn't that yes, right? yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yes. So yeah, there's just an enlarged version of the, of the diamonds that are being found on, now on four continents. Uh. These are your selected area electron diffraction patterns at the bottom, um, which is the SAD, SAD, selected area diffraction patterns used to identify nanodiamonds in the carbon spherules. Um, this one is Kimball Bay, South Carolina. This is from a carbon spheral. This is from the Topper site, um, which is also South Carolina, which is the site that Brad and I visited with um, – with Graham Hancock and George Howard and uh, Al Goodyear, the head uh, archaeologist there, who's been a co-author of several of the pro-impact uh, papers that have come out. Um, Germany. Um, so here's just a closer look at this. Um, 
we probably don't need to get into all of this. Uh, just showing abundance peaks consistent with the uh, younger Dryas and falling within the within the range that you would expect nano diamonds. Uh, and here's a, what's called a Lons delight crystal. Uh, you have transmission electron microscope image from Arlington Canyon, California. And here's the same electron microscope images of the same crystal. Uh, and then corresponding energy dispersive X-ray spectrometry elemental carbon map of the crystal here. Uh, no other elements were detected. So these things are almost pure carbon. So, yeah, we won't necessarily need to get into this uh, other than the fact that, uh, yes, presence of nanodiamonds at 24 sites in 10 countries on three continents, including results from six independent groups. So what happens? You've got, you've got the critics coming out with their knee-jerk response a couple of weeks after the idea is first proposed. Now you've got, here at this point, six, which has now grown to eight independent teams, because this is 2014, six years ago, right? So you now here you have six independent groups that go out, and guess what? They're actually finding stuff. If those other guys wouldn't have been so quick to react and it actually had an open mind and said, well, sounds outrageous, but let's, let's check it out. Check. Yeah. They didn't do that. They didn't do that. They assumed right from the beginning, oh, this is some extraordinary claim, and we can just pretty much dismiss it. because. But, but like the proponents have said, well, here's the thing. Now you're stuck with what is your explanation then for what happened? You don't provide anything. What, are you going to go back to the idea that bare, you know, barefoot paleo-Indian hunters with spears? You know, Now, get this. You know, Frank Hibben back in uh, the 1940s estimated that 40 million individual animals minimum died at the Pleistocene Holocene transition. We've, we've talked about his work. We're going to come back to his work because there's been some new studies on the Alaskan muck that completely supports and vindicates Frank Hibben, right? Even though they attempted to discredit him, he's been vindicated. So we've got to come back and we need to talk about these new studies on the Alaskan muck. But anyways, Frank Hibben estimated that there was at least 40 million animals. Okay, you go to the, uh, to the uh, teams that are involved in estimating human population during the late Pleistocene, and the estimates of human population range from 1 million to 10 million individual people. Think about that. Even if you took the high number of 10 million people, you're going to say that 10 million people were able to exterminate 40 million animals over, what, 1,000, 2,000 years over the whole face of the globe? I, you know, I, I just find that hard to, hard to even imagine that, that people could entertain an idea like that in all seriousness. But what are you left with? What are you left with if you, if you, if you're, if you right from the beginning, you reject the possibility of a cosmic impact, what are you left with? Climate change? Oh, well, how does that work? You know, I mean, sure, the, so the climate changes, right? So, but the thing is, okay, if you're talking about a climate change of a degree or a couple of degrees over centuries, okay, well, you know, animals have been dealing with that for, for countless millennia, and they can adapt, right? Vegetation shifts, and, but we're talking about climate change that could be 15 degrees Fahrenheit in a matter of a year, a couple of years. Well, you don't have an explanation for that. You know, you don't have an explanation for how you could melt so much water that you're getting these mega floods that are only measured in sphere drops of 300, 400, 600, 700 million cubic feet per second. You don't have an explanation for that. You know, you don't have an explanation for these huge spikes of climate warming and cooling that characterize the transition. So, I mean, look. You can say that the, whatever, you can try to dismiss the, the, the catastrophism inherent in this evidence, but I think that in the end, you're, 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 you're going to end up looking silly. So, anyways, let's go to one more study. So, that's, uh, that's some of the most telling evidence, and it's found in all these sites on multiple continents, and there's not really a, a, another explanation for those things being there. So, that's, it's not quite the nail in the coffin, but it's pretty damn close. Yes. On the, on the ET impact theory. Yeah. At the YDB. 
Okay, and then we have a study uh, that came out. Uh, well, let's see, I don't have pagination on this one. Um, right around the same time, it was uh, Kerbatov was the lead author, the first discovery of nano diamonds in the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, let's see. So Alan West was one of the authors. Doug and James Kennett were there. Ted Bunch, you know, James Whitkey, um, and Thomas Stafford. You guys have, have communicated with Stafford about the Hall Cave, right? Right. Yeah, that's okay. So that's, that's what I thought. So, so uh, certainly, um, you know, credible individuals. Uh, so they did this study, which I'm going to refer to right now, I think. Um, okay. Yeah, here we go. I got it. Okay. Here we go. So this was 2010. So this actually precedes the 2014 by four years. Um, and this is the one with uh, Kerbatov, Mayuski, uh, Alan West, Bunch, you know, um, Kinsey. So Kinsey uh, was on this. This was a paper that he was one of the co-authors. This is four years before the paper we were just looking at, which was where he was the lead author. Wendy Wolbach, is, as her name is on this, we, we know her from you know, going back all the way to uh, biomass burning studies at the KT Boundary. Okay, so in this paper came out in 2010, it's in Journal of Glaciology, and the title of the paper is Discovery of a Nano-Diamond Rich Layer in the Greenland Ice Sheet. We report the discovery in the Greenland Ice Sheet of a discrete layer of free nano-diamonds in very high abundances, implying most likely either an unprecedented influx of extraterrestrial material or a cosmic event that occurred after the last glacial episode. From that layer, we extracted nanodiamonds and hexagonal diamonds, and in parentheses, Lonsdalite, an accepted ET impact indicator at abundances of up to uh, 5 times 10 to the 6th, or 5 million times greater than the background levels in adjacent younger and older ice. The nano diamonds in the concentrated layer are rounded, suggesting they move through some process similar to carbon vapor deposition or high explosive depos detonation. One of these processes, which we won't have time to get into tonight, though, this carbon vapor deposition, is that the diamonds might accrete right out of or consolidate right out of this vapor that's formed in the high energy plume of an impact. Very interesting. Um, let's see, uh, or high explosive detonation. This morphology has not been reported previously in cosmic material, but has been observed in terrestrial impact material. This is the first highly enriched discrete layer of nano diamonds observed in glacial ice anywhere. And its presence indicates that ice caps are important archives of ET events of varying magnitudes. Using a preliminary ice chronology based on oxygen isotopes and dust stratigraphy, the nanodiamond rich layer appears to be coeval with nanodiamond abundance peaks reported at numerous North American sites in a sedimentary layer, the younger driest boundary layer, dating to 12.9 plus or minus 0 0.1 Ka. However, more investigation is needed to confirm this association. Um, recently, scientists reported an abundance peak in nanodiamonds at multiple locations across North America that is restricted to a thin sediment layer, the Younger Dryas Boundary layer, which dates to the Younger Dryas Boundary onset. A peak in Lons Delight or hexagonal diamonds was also reported in the YDB at Arlington Canyon, California, by Kennett and others in 2009. The only known explanation for terrestrial Lons Delight is by arrival inside extraterrestrial objects and or by impacts of such objects with the Earth's surface. 
This discovery begged a prediction that a coeval layer with high nanodiamond concentrations should be preserved in the Greenland ice sheet. So first you've got the discovery in sediments in North America. This suggests, okay, well, maybe we should go look at the Younger Dryas boundary in the Greenland ice sheet and see if we find nanodiamonds. Consequently, we conducted a pilot investigation on a section of the Greenland ice sheet that potentially spans the last deglacial in search of a layer containing an abundance of free nanodiamonds that might be coeval with that of the YDB, a study that included both field and laboratory components. Ice samples of large volume were necessary to conduct these investigations, and sufficient ice from deep cores uh, are unavailable. Consequently, we followed the earlier approach of Rhea and others, Petrenko and others, who sampled the ice margin to obtain a stratigraphic sequence over the interval from the last deglacial through the Holocene. In cooperation with PBS Nova Documentary Productions, we conducted field work in late 2008, during which several authors sampled a margin site east of Kangerlooslock. West Greenland. Let's just say West Greenland, okay? One kilometer inland from the ice margin. Our goal was to collect continuous samples of ice extending from the end of the last glacial episode through the early Holocene, including the 1,300-year-long Younger Dryas cooling episode. One of the authors has considerable experience sampling along the Greenland ice sheet margin, and he identified a candidate for the YD age section based upon visual inspection of dust stratigraphy. Our sampling was guided by the presence of clear dust poor ice, assumed early Holocene age, stratigraphically higher than a sharp visual change into dusty ice of inferred Younger Dryas age, beneath which was another sharp change into clear ice of assumed Balling Alarod age that was preceded by a dusty ice of assumed late glacial age. Now, notice. Wow, that's really cool. It is. Clear ice, dusty ice, clear ice. We've talked about this. Why Younger Dryas dusty ice? Because there's no vegetation to hold down the dust. The wind is right. blowing over a wasteland. Yeah. Dang it. Dang it. That's awesome. <laughs> and at that point, I'm going to do a quick screen share to show you what they were up to. Uh, so you can see how they did this. This is pretty cool. Um, let's go to screen share. So here you can see the dusty layer right in here. Uh, this yeah. is the upper section of the trench at Kanger. If anybody knows how to pronounce that. I don't speak, what language do they speak up in Greenland? I don't even know. I guess we're going to believe it's Denmark. It's a territory of Denmark. Okay, that would make sense. So this might be a Danish word, Danish name. I don't know. Anyways, uh, showing a dusty ice layer sandwiched between clearer ice. The nano diamond peak layer lies immediately below the base of the dusty layer as marked. Right here, you see this nano diamond peak layer right there? Boom. Preliminary data suggests that the dusty layer may represent the Younger Dryas cooling episode. If so, then the nano diamond peak immediately predates the base of the dusty layer, marking the YD onset. And here's your vertical abundance distribution of nano diamonds from table two over here. Uh, compared with a low-resolution Delta Oxygen 18 trench record that exhibits an apparent episode of cooling. You see the apparent episode of cooling right here based upon your oxygen isotopes in the ice. So right here, notice this plunge from warm to cold. And that coincides precisely with that transition layer, the YDB boundary layer. And here would be your cold period. Uh, you're looking at 5.5 meters down into the ice. Um, and here's your peak in nanodiamonds right here. 10 to the 6th. This is a lot of damn nanodiamonds they found there. A lot. Okay. So they go on to say, 
The final and preferred hypothesis is that the Greenland nano diamond peak layer, which appears to date to the onset of the YD, is the result of a major impact event. In support of this, the continent wide Cretaceous tertiary boundary layer is accepted to contain nano diamonds that, not, that did not arrive from space inside the impactor, but rather crystallized from carbon-rich terrestrial material during that hyper-velocity impact. During our Greenland research, we also examined nanodiamonds from KT sediments collected in Caravaca, Spain, and Needles Point, New Zealand. The impact layers at both sites display substantial abundances of Lonsdalite and N-diamonds having the same morphology and range of sizes as those found in the Greenland samples, while background levels were at zero or very low, as they are in Greenland. Likewise, nanodiamonds extracted from Younger Dryas boundary samples collected in North America and Europe display the same rounded morphology and range of sizes as those found in the KT sediments and in Greenland. Of course, it is possible that the nanodiamonds in Greenland formed through some, un, some as yet undiscovered natural process other than cosmic impact. However, that seems unlikely since intense diamond research spanning more than a century indicates that the formation of nanodiamonds and Lonsdalite in particular requires extraordinary temperature, pressure, and redox conditions that rule out natural processes that occur either on or below the surface of the Earth. Thus, since the YDB is the only other known continent-wide diamond layer in the entire tested geological record, other than that at the KT boundary, the most consistent hypothesis is that nanodiamonds in the YDB formed during a major cosmic impact event. Continent-wide diamond layer. Yes. That's a lot of bling. <laughs> that Ooh, is yeah. a lot of diamonds. <laughs> and then, That's what I was going to try to help summarize, too, is it's pointing at a, a land impact. All, all the evidence we've been looking for, yeah. looking at before about air bursts and comparing it to Tunguska, but now these nano diamonds are definitely from impacts into the land. So you've got many, many objects coming in, it seems like, you know, getting totally opposite from that, that 2008 paper that said, well, it was a four or five kilometer object, right? So now we've just got evidence left and right, multi-continents, but that where, it could have been air bursts and land impacts. Where are the yeah. craters now? Well, I they could have been washed out, washed out. Ah, well, possibly by mega floods. Yeah, yeah, that's possible. Could be in sure. Scablands. Yeah. Well, I'm not ever. I have never really said that the Scablands themselves were the site of an impact. We did right. hypothesize, though, that up, say, perhaps on the Fraser Plateau or the Nachaco Plateau. Initially, the Nachaco Plateau. I'm still proposing as a potential impact site up right. in c central BC, up by uh, uh, St. Um, George. Prince, Prince. Prince, Prince George. George. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Brad. Yeah. Prince George. Okay. Yes. Prince George. Okay. Uh, that Prince George might have been close to an epicenter. But of course, so now a question becomes could an impact into an ice sheet produce um, nanodiamonds? Ah, uh, yeah, right. That's the next question we should ask. But if it if it fell on near the margins, it still could have caused rapid melting, and then of course the melting would roll right over the crater, and it'd be gone, right? Because it took out thousands of feet of sediment in some places. And look, I mean, I if, mean if, if near if if it impacted near the margin where the ice is thinner, now your 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 probabilities of it penetrating fully through the ice. You know, hitting the, the 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 terrestrial target material beneath the ice increased considerably. However, yeah. now you've got the melting and the the flooding, and yes, so you might have an impact near the ice margin where the 
thickness of the ice is only 1,000 feet, say, or 1,500 feet. The object penetrates. It excavates a crater, but the subsequent melting now obscures the crater. Right. And any moving of the glacier that didn't immediately melt would definitely scour it down to nothing. Right. And and some of those glaciers, there's pictures of glaciers that have so much sediment entrained in them that that may be where the nanodiamonds are coming from because it's hitting all this material held in the ice. I don't mm-hmm. know. I'm just guessing. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. No. But we've well, got Nipigon, we've got St. Jean, Prince George. We've looked at all three of those. And we're going to, we're going to actually, at some point, we're going to present a more coherent uh, mapping of potential impact sites. All right. Cause we're looking at perhaps as many as seven different sites that could have been impacts. And, and the more I look at it, you know, multiple events. There could have been a path that goes this direction and a path 1,300 years that goes this direction. There might not all be from the same bombardment. Yeah. And see, that's where one of the things that intrigues me is this evidence for something at 14,600. Meltwater Pulse 1A is don't is is, is um, dated that's to right. 146. Yeah, and then... Isn't George's George Howard's tusk dated to like thirty thousand, and it's got twenty something thousand? We're, and it's got it's and magnetic, 000, yeah, and we're going to get right into that when we when I referenced earlier this uh, new studies on the Alaskan muck. Yeah, and his right. tusk has magnetic particles embedded in it, so yes, that seems to imply something weird happened there too, and that's even earlier, even earlier. Lots of mysteries. Yes. Lots of mysteries. Well, that's what makes it so damn interesting. That's right. And fun. Yeah. Frank and Frankenstein. Mul- multiple Frankensteins going <laughs> right. on here. Lots of monsters. I was, <laughs> I was waiting on you guys to say that's another band name, but I guess you can't use Frankenstein. Cos- cosmic Frankenstein. <laughs> that or is a catastrophic Frank- rock from Cosmic <laughs> Frankenstein. <laughs> well, that is a good, it's a great band name. <laughs> <laughs> we should have come coming back from the uh, break. We should have played uh, Frankenstein by the Edgar Winter Group. The Edgar Winter. You guys do remember that, right? Yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Here, yeah. I've listened to it all the time. That's right. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, my, my, even, I, I'm going to guess even Mike knows Frankenstein by Edgar Winter Group, right? Uh, I know Edgar Werner. I don't think I've ever heard Frankenstein. Oh, come on, you guys. Uh, he'd know it if he heard it. Yeah. yeah. Randall's about to quit the podcast. <laughs> I am. I'm out of here. <laughs> Jeez, you, what are you? <laughs> Uh, what are, who are you? Who are these who, people? Who are these there? people? I'm still trying to get straight now. Which one is Russ and which one is Kyle? Um, oh, okay. <laughs> Did that help? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, okay. So Good going alphabetical. Not much. Not much. K R. That's how I keep going. No, I, I no no I I somewhere around the end of the first year I think I finally got it straight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, man, we're maxing out here. Do you got more to wrap up, or do we want to do some summary? Oh, I got, I got lots of and other stuff. Oh, I know you do. I got lots more. I'll, I'll just mention this one one study that came out the what the next year. Uh, well, this was 2014. Um, a study from Oklahoma. Uh, interesting study entitled "Quantifying the Distribution of Nano Diamonds in Pre Younger Dryas to Recent Age Deposits." along Bull Creek, Oklahoma, Panhandle, USA. And what's interesting about, there's a couple things about this that are, that are quite interesting to me. Um, they, they say uh, this, is the high, this is by Leland C. Bement, who's with the Oklahoma Archaeological Survey, Andrew S. Madden, who's with the School of Geology and Geophysics, University of Oklahoma, et cetera. There's about what, seven or eight of these. Um, okay. So they go, high levels of nanodiamonds have been used to support the transformative hypothesis that an ET event or a comet explosion triggered younger dryas changes in temperature, flora and fauna assemblages, and human adaptations. We evaluate this hypothesis by establishing the distribution of nanodiamonds within the Bull Creek drainage of the Beaver River Basin in the Oklahoma Panhandle. The earlier report of an abundant spike of nanodiamonds in the Bull Creek, younger driest boundary soil is confirmed. 
Um, in their significance of their findings, they say in 2007, scientists proposed that the start of the Younger Dryas chronozone and late Pleistocene extinctions resulted from the explosion of a comet in the Earth's atmosphere. The ET event, as it is known, is purportedly marked by high levels of various materials, including nanodiamonds. Nanodiamonds had previously been reported from the Bull Creek, Oklahoma area. We investigate this claim here by quantifying the distribution of nanodiamonds in sediments of different periods within the Bull Creek Valley. We found high levels of nanodiamonds in the Younger Dryas boundary deposits supporting the previous claim. But here's something that's very interesting to me. A second spike in nanodiamonds during the late Holocene suggests that the distribution of nanodiamonds is not unique to the Younger Dryas. So they found the spike at the Younger Dryas as predicted, but they also found this second spike. Where did that come from? That's an interesting question to me. And I want to look into that more and see what, if anything, since 2014, they have concluded about that second spike of nanodiamonds. Um, Yes, our study identified uh, a nanodiamond speak, nano spike of 190 parts per million immediately below a soil horizon interpreted as the Younger Dryas boundary. Our, our findings also identified identical high quantities of nanodiamonds in late Holocene deposits at the Bull Creek Interval. The second spike of nanodiamonds indicates that high levels of nanodiamonds are not unique to the Younger Dryas boundary, but it was a spike. So in other words, you don't have a uniform distribution of nanodiamonds throughout the sedimentary column. You have a spike right there at the Younger Dryas, but now you got this other spike, right? So, yeah. I mean, clearly that's suggesting what? An impact. It does. Now, Unless you found this spike other places, it might have only been a local or regional effect. Um, the implications of this finding is that either a similar process for concentrating diamonds was acting at both times, or a similar event that created the spike at the Younger Dryas boundary also occurred during the late Holocene. So that to me was, was an extremely interesting find. Although the high concentration of nanodiamonds at the Younger Dryas boundary along the Bull Creek may support the ET hypothesis, the high concentration of nanodiamonds identified in late Holocene deposits indicates such levels are not unique. Well, again, what that would suggest to me is that impacts are not are unique. Not unique, <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> and 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 the other conclusion is that I think that once we've sifted through the bulk of this evidence, it's clearly pointing to the fact that cosmic impacts are a hell of a lot more frequent than anybody was assuming even a few yeah. decades ago. I wonder if that late Holocene spike coincides with any like large civilization collapses that we could look for in history. That would be interesting. Too. Okay, wait a minute. Here we go. Oh, 3,000 radiocarbon years before present. Okay, so 1,000 B.C deposits it's enigmatic they're calling it enigmatic the nano diamond spike radio yeah is enigmatic hmm. Hmm. that is interesting yeah so okay let's see so uh there was a a smaller spike in nano diamonds occurrence was identified in the hearth site deposits of similar age the hearth site is a short-term camp dated to 25, 2,540 plus or minus 40 radiocarbon years before present. The cultural material included a fire hearth and scatter of tools and bison bones. Um, sediments from below at and above this occupation level were scrutinized for nanodiamonds. Low, low quantities of nanodiamonds were found in three of six samples. Um, so this distribution suggests that human activity did not promote the accumulation of nanodiamonds. Uh, so the possibility exists that perhaps whatever generated the high nanodiamond spike at the uh, Bull 
Creek interval in the soil A horizon in Eolian deposits is reflected in the measurable background level, blah, 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 blah. Because I'm, but the point is two spikes. Yeah. And one of these appears to be about uh, 2,500 years ago. So I'm, my suggestion would be we're seeing da- at the younger driest boundary, we're seeing something that's on a much more global or hemispheric scale. My first supposition would be that this is probably a more local or regional. A local, yeah. Tunguska scale event, say. So I think that's a good place to wrap it up for the, for this point. I think so. That was a great show. All right. Wow. Thanks, buddy. More to come. Yeah. We're going to get back to Lake Hind next week. All right. And then from there, we're going to start talking about macro evidence and the, and the, the, the evidence for potential impacts into the ice sheet. And if we can identify where Sweet. impacts may have occurred. All right. Outstanding. Look forward to that. Me too. Yep. Well, we're still, uh, website's about to come out, right? About to be. It should be finished. I think they, you know, Mike Robertson is looking to put a wrap on it this week or by next All right. weekend. Fantastic. Yeah. Days. In time for Mere my birthday. days. We're not talking weeks anymore. Mere days. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exciting. Yeah. In time for my, you guys are going to do it on my birthday, right? Hey, that's, what that's better- the date. August 1st. It's a very yeah. auspicious day, world changing. Perfect. Yes. Come on. Let's do it. That's it. Perfect. That's, <laughs> yeah. About Russ that. rules all. <laughs> all and, right. And as we segue into the the, the flooding, that's where we're going to be doing prep for the, uh, hopefully, the late September field trip. Yes. To the scab right. lands. So all the links for that are in the show notes. Yeah. Go check that out. And also there's links for supporting the show. And thanks so much to everybody who does. We really Absolutely. appreciate the support. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Um, you guys are helping us so much. And we're working hard to get our act organized on this end. Um, and we will. It's we happening. Will. And when yeah, we do, yeah, we're going to. Thank you. Sorry. Go ahead. Well, when we do, we're going to throw a big party. We're going to invite everybody who listens. All right. And Man, that's going to be a real big party. A real, okay. <laughs> that's, that's the only kind, right? That's right. <laughs> Although sometimes, you know, I, I, I occasionally indulge in a party of one. Party of one. Uh, party of Nothing one. Wrong yeah. with that. <laughs> I don't want to hear about that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just want to express our appreciation, as you're starting to say, to the Patreon contributors. Uh, the people that are putting in one-time donations that don't want to be part of Patreon. We appreciate yep. all that. It's it's going to great use and definitely being put aside for future efforts. Um, there's, there's a lot of good things coming and we're figuring out how to do this. It's, it's been great that everybody's climbed on the bus with us and uh, trying to keep up with the comments and uh, appreciate all that positivity coming through the, the YouTube comments yep. and uh, they're going to, they're going to keep coming fast and furious as, as we continue forward with this. And, and as we get more support, it's going to allow us to do it more often, which we're excited about. That's right. All right. You guys know the email address, but it is cosmographia1618 at gmail.com. So that's how you can get a hold of us. Everything else is in the show notes. Thank you guys so much. Excellent show. See you next week. Good night, guys. Can't wait till next week. We'll see you there. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.